who's ready for some natural dyeing. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today I am going to dye some yarn using some dried black walnut hulls. Now, this is not the first time I've tried dyeing with walnut, although the first time I tried, I think probably a year and a half ago, I did use a walnut paste versus dried hulls. So the techniques and the base and everything I'm using today are slightly different, but I am very excited for this exploration. If you are new to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel, you should know that I often try things for the first time on camera, which means that sometimes things work really, really well, and then it makes it an awesome tutorial, and other times things work okay, which means it's a great example of, all right, these are things maybe I want to tweak when I'm going to do it myself. So I wanted to give that heads up that I am very much a novice when it comes to natural dyes, but I do love to play with color. So if you want to explore dyeing yarn in many different techniques with me, please subscribe. Before we jump into the project, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to today's Dye Pot Weekly lab partner, Tina. Tina, thank you so much for being my lab partner today and requesting that I explore more with natural dyes and non-superwash yarn. I am really, really excited and hope that we're going to love the results. The dye we're using today is about a half ounce of walnut hulls from Earth Hues. And I've used some of their other natural dye powders before at a time when I did an experiment just crudely comparing using an a la mordant versus no mordant with various different colors. And in some cases, it made a huge difference having the mordant. For example, for logwood, with no mordant, you got more of a deep brown, and with the mordant, you got a purple. Uh, so it can make a huge difference. Uh, and I believe that with walnut hulls, having a mordant can give you a warmer, richer tone in some kind of ways. But because the walnut hulls have their own tannins in it, you don't actually need a mordant to set the color. And so that is what I want to do today. I want to just use the walnut hulls and dye some non-superwash yarn. The yarn is Knit Picks Merino Style DK. This yarn is 100% superwash merino. Now, the, this walnut hull sample that I got actually came as part of, I think it was the November 2020 Paradise Fibers Fiber of the Month Club. This video is not sponsored, but I am an affiliate marketer with both Paradise Fibers and Knit Picks, and so I'll put links to the tutorial I'm going to follow in the video description in addition to links to both of those websites. And in the Fiber of the Month Club, they actually gave us this little tea bag, and I am going to be filling this to help keep some of the sediment out of the pot. Now, the, they also did provide with aluminum sulfate and cream of tartar um, that we could use if we wanted to add mordant, um, but I will save this to use for another project at a later date. Over my limited experience, I've decided that my favorite way to mordant fiber is to do a cool mordant and soak the yarn in with the aluminum sulfate for a period of days uh, versus heating it. I found that that made the fiber it the fiber was in better condition overall versus when I tried a hot mordant technique. Um, and so I do prefer to do this outside, um, but that is my comfort level. But I will be putting on a respirator mask with P100 filters when I am dealing with the walnut powder. You don't wanna risk inhaling everything. And so I just wanna remind people that just because you're using a natural dye, this doesn't mean that it's necessarily safer or that you don't need to take the same precautions that you might take if you're using other types of commercial dyes. One other note, uh, today with the amount of dye that we have, we probably are gonna get a light color. And this time I know this uh, because the instructions on the Paradise Fibers website said that the amount that they provided in the kit isn't enough to achieve a light color on six ounces of yarn. Now we might get something more medium because 100 grams of yarn is a bit under four ounces of fiber. So maybe we'll get something more medium. But in general, as a rule of thumb, Paradise Fibers recommends using 
two tablespoons of the walnut hulls per pound of fiber for a light shade, and then up to six tablespoons of the powder for a dark shade per pound of fiber. And I would say looking at this, maybe we have about a tablespoon here. So I would say hopefully we can get a good light shade, maybe medium shade. Fingers crossed. The plan today is to simmer the dye in our stainless steel dye pot that's dedicated for dyeing yarn and never used for food for two hours. And then we're gonna let it cool completely overnight. Tomorrow we will add our pre-soaked yarn to the dye bath and heat it uh, following some temperature protocols for a couple of hours total and then let it cool down. Now depending on how things go, we may still have some color in the dye pot after we dye this first skein and if we do, at that point we will attempt to dye a superwash skein of yarn. In general, with the natural dyeing I've done so far, if you have non-superwash yarn and superwash yarn in the same pot, the superwash yarn will absorb more color. Something about the superwash process, which removes some scales from the wool, I think makes it easier for it to absorb dye. So that's a result with superwash versus non that I see consistently over time. Since we don't have a lot of dye, I don't want to have both in the same pot because I do want our non superwash yarn to get as much of the color as we can. But yeah, that's I guess the general plan. And now let's get suited up and ready to set up our dye bath. The directions say to pour boiling water over the walnut hulls until it is dissolved. But it does note um, that there could be some shell debris in here that won't dissolve. And so one reason to use this tea bag is that you can then filter out that shell debris. And so that is my plan today. Now I'm gonna make a paper funnel like so, then I'm gonna to use to add the powder <laughs> into the tea bag. Um, hopefully that should go pretty smoothly. But I think I am already deviating from the instructions. I am going to boil water in my stainless steel dye pot and add the tea bag to that. Um, mainly because logistically, that's the easiest way for me to do it. And since it's a tea bag, uh, I think that'll work. And then I have a stainless steel spoon that I'll use to um, sort of gently stir this through and hopefully we'll see the color come out and dissolve in our liquid. One reason why I'm picking this volume of water is that I know it's a volume that should cover our yarn well. And in fact, we might end up adding more water uh, in the end anyway. So fingers crossed that this isn't gonna make such a huge difference. But uh, I think that it, yeah, it just seems like it's an easier way for me to film it and manage with the way my stove and everything is set up. So that's my plan. All right, my voice is now more muffled because I am wearing a respirator and I've got my safety glasses and gloves on. Now, I'm gonna make my paper funnel, pop it in this little tea bag, and prop it. Well, I don't want it to knock over, but I am now going to open the walnut, and I can now hold this so we can transfer this. There we go. I didn't measure it because the bag says it's about half an ounce. Um, so I did not measure the volume in here. And trying to get everything out of this bag that I can. Oh dear. Oh no, oh no. And attempting to not make a mess. did end up in the bag. I am going to dispose. Well, actually, let's see if I can get any more out. Uh, it's a really, really fine powder. Okay. 
I am now going to try to clean this up, dispose of this. Now, if you've ever been around walnut trees, you know that they do stain. So, <laughs> I mean, that's how we're dying with this. But, and it does look like the powder sort of streaks like dyes would. So I'm now going to close, I think and tie, I haven't used a tea bag like this before. The one problem with gloves is that it is hard to tie things. Okay, now I think we're ready. So I'm gonna go clean up a little bit, bring the camera over to the table, and then we'll start steeping. Okay, here's our boiling water. I'm reducing it a little bit to low. And I'm supposed to pour it over the dye, but instead I am going this way. And by pouring it over the dye, I am bringing the dye in like so. I don't know what kind of bag this is <laughs> and how easy it may or may not rip. But I will say it does seem like the color is dissolving. It's getting nice and dark. I'm going to let this sit in here, go clean up, and then we'll come back and stir and puff and I can remove my mask because everything is wet now. But I am leaving the mask on while I go clean up. This is looking really dark. This is great. So the instructions say to simmer, simmer on low flame for two hours. Walnut hulls contain high amounts of tannic acid as well as a component of juglone, the active colorant. Huh. I guess as, as someone with a uh, natural product biosynthesis background, I'm curious if that is the name of the molecule, um, but anyway, uh, that's something for me to research later. Uh, the rich brown color develops with oxygen, so it's necessary to simmer the walnut hulls slash powder in order to achieve the best color result. So I think that means... And yeah, look how much darker it's getting. Um, it's nice and steamy. I think that it means that we keep trying to pick up the bag so I can try to tell if things are like coming out of it. I don't know. I'm also trying to look and see, okay, it does not look like stuff is dissolved for, to me. And it's possible the bag isn't doing much good. So if I bring this over, I'm not sure if you can see there, you can see that sediment on the spoon. Um, but, you know, certainly it looks like a deep color. So anyway, I'm gonna have this on this low simmer for two hours and then we will come back. But I don't, I don't know how often I need to stir it or what, but let's just hope. <laughs> oh, and I know it's really, really steamy on the camera, but you can see how deep it is, which is a great sign. So I'll see you in two hours. I don't know if the walnut hulls are supposed to simmer covered or uncovered. I do have a cover on here just because I'm keeping an eye on the levels, um, I feel like it can still get oxygen if covered, but the instructions don't say, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to let you all know that I am covering it. Okay, it has been, that's warm. That's warm. It has been two hours, and there is still absolutely that sediment see if you guys can see on the spoon. Yeah, I guess you can see a little bit. That sediment is absolutely still there. I mean, the color looks like a dark coffee. I don't know if those are the hulls or what, but what we're gonna do now is turn off the heat. I'm gonna place the cover back on, and I'm actually gonna remove this from the heat 
and let it cool off completely overnight. So then tomorrow we can dye the yarn. And I have a feeling we're gonna wanna add more liquid into the pot, but it did simmer for two hours. And hi, you can see me. So yeah, I'll see you in the morning. I pre-soaked the Merino Style Decay in some plain tap water for about an hour. Our dye bath is completely cool. Uh, and now we are going to add our pre-soaked yarn. I am squeezing out very gently excess water from the pre-soak. And then coming over with my spoon to, whoa, look at how dark this is, to add it to the pot. Now you can see that we're going to need more liquid. I'm not measuring, but I'm coming over with the pre-soak and I'm going to add enough water to cover, to cover the yarn. Um, I don't care about getting even color coverage, and that's not something that concerns me. I don't mind if it's a tonal, but uh, if you do want more even color coverage, then you should, looks like my pre-soak was not perfect, then you will want more water. And so I am coming, and I'm gonna add a bit more water so that way we can stir things gently and there's more space for stuff to move around here in the pot. Now I'm going to set aside my spoon and we are going to turn on the heat to slowly start heating this up. I do have a dedicated dye candy thermometer that I am planning to use to check the temperature. I mean, I guess I don't need to check right now because um, it is not very hot, but the goal is to bring things to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which the thermometer doesn't really go that low because it's a candy thermometer, but so we'll try to bring it to just below where it would start to register and we'll keep it at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes, gently moving the fiber uh, a little bit at a time and then we will slowly bring the temperature up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and keep it there for 30 to 45 minutes. So I am going to keep a close eye on this stirring occasionally um, and yeah I'll let's wait say 10 minutes and I'll come back and check in actually no I'm gonna start a stopwatch and let you know about how long it took me on medium heat to get to about 90 degrees even stirring with cold water it really only took about three minutes to get to 100 degrees on my thermometer uh, so I have turned the heat to low and I'm gonna leave it here for 30 minutes, gently rotating the fiber occasionally. Now, when, when you stir it carefully, don't forget that you're using non-superwashed fiber, so you really don't want to agitate it. Um, again, I'm okay with some uneven color coverage, but I do wanna to try to get consistent heat. And it does look like we're at about 110, uh, so I might even turn off the heat uh, for a little bit just to maintain our temperature, which is slightly warmer than room temperature. I don't use a thermometer very often when I'm dyeing yarn at all. And if this is something that you would like me to play around with more, please let me know. I am a little too warm for what it is, and I'm not sure for the chemistry necessary for keeping things at a warm but lower temperature before moving slowly to the higher temperature. But I will say that giving the, this time could allow things um, to get that more even color coverage if that's what you're going for, potentially. At least that's my hypothesis. But anyway, uh, I am going to wait the rest of the 30 minutes. Since we are over 100 degrees right now in here, there isn't a need for me to add more heat. So it'll probably maintain this and be above 90 for most of the time, but I will, again, be checking back in. All right, 30 minutes are up. The heat is still uh, off and it's about 105 in here. So I'm now gonna turn the heat back on to low and we are going to slowly and I haven't stirred this since the last check-in. Uh, we are gonna slowly raise the heat up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 
See, I am following the protocol today, best I can. Now, in terms of sediment, I don't know if y'all can see, I guess barely. There, you can see sort of at the bottom. There is still definitely sediment in here. Oh yeah, the, the tea bag. I didn't take it out, so that should be in here too. I didn't see it <laughs> this morning, but I also didn't really stir it. Um, well, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to set a little timer to cut, try to keep track how long it'll take to get up to 180 degrees. Uh, and I'm on like fairly low right now, so I'll turn it up higher if we need to, but we do want to raise the temperature slowly because that's what the protocol says. So I will check back in once we are up to temp. I'm measuring the time that it's taking things to warm up, not because I think that that is critical, but uh, it's also helpful for just future reference to realize, oh, we hit 90 really, really fast, and then the next might take a longer period of time. Uh, sometimes when I'm doing natural dyeing on my electric burners outside, it can take hours to come up to temp. So I don't expect that it would take hours because I know that with the gas stove, it doesn't take that long to come to a boil. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. And I will stir every once in a while, maybe, or I might just leave it, but I think the stirring is more to just redistribute the heat um, and check the temperature on the thermometer. All right, it has been about 20 minutes and we are at 180 degrees. Um, so we are truly in the just below a boil territory. Now, one thing I want to say, I would love it if this is the color that we see, um, but we don't know that this much pigment is going to stay. It's possible that we could have this much pigment, or it could be much lighter. So I'm now gonna reduce the heat to low, and I am going to keep an eye on this. Um, okay, since stirring, we're closer to about 190. Okay, I'm actually gonna turn off the heat because it went a little over, and I am gonna set a timer for 45 minutes. I'll keep an eye on the temperature, and if we start to drop below 180, I'll turn the heat back on. I'm glad I'm doing this inside on the gas stove because it is a lot easier to regulate the amount of heat that you have on your pot when you want to control the temperature uh, inside it than when you're on an electric pot. I suppose you could just remove it from the heat source entirely, but it also takes longer for it to heat back up. So yeah, I mean, I guess I thought we were close to 190. We are like at 185 right now, so that is good. Hopefully not too hot. Uh, I don't think that it's like that critical, but again, I don't really know. I mean, I the last time I dyed with walnut, I think I had like sort of almost like a double boiler type situation inside mason jars, and I definitely had the bath boiling, which is hotter than 180. Uh, so that's just something to also keep in mind as we go about this. But I am really, really excited um, because I really, really like this color. And again, the if you want the warmer color, that sort of like a more orange yellow brown color that you see on the Paradise Fibers tutorial. Uh, for that, you will want to use the alum mordant and the cream of tartar that came with it. That helps shift the hue. Uh, a lot of natural dyes having a mordant, a metal ion in there will shift the color that you see, which is a big reason to use mordants at times, but Yes, I will be keeping a very close eye on this thermometer, and <laughs> otherwise we'll come back in 45 minutes. It has now been 45 minutes, and we're at about 195 degrees Fahrenheit right now. I would say that this is the highest the temperature has been during this time. I'm going to turn the heat off on the stove completely now. The lowest it got to was about 170, but it was right around 180, 185 for most of the 45 minutes. I don't think you necessarily need to be this 
uh, strict over the temperature control, but I, you know, wanted to try to do my best to be as uh, close to the instructions I was following as possible. And so now um, the instructions say to take the pot off the heat uh, and let it cool down to room temperature. And so that is exactly what I will do. I am going to remove this from the burner and just let it cool. And then once it's at room temperature, we will come and remove the yarn and try to wash it, I guess. So why not just remove the yarn from the pot now? Well, just like last night, the long cool off period will give more time for our yarn to be in contact with the dye. And the slow cool can pass through any optimal temperatures for the dyes to bind. And so this is really just giving more time for things to happen. I'm actually surprised that the time scales we're using today are relatively short. I think overall this whole process has taken me about, you know, not even two hours, an hour, 45 minutes or so. So that is, again, shorter than maybe I expected and maybe I've done at other times, although I haven't gone back and looked at what I did with walnut. I decided to just follow these instructions. I'm following the instructions, but I'm optimistic. The color that we're seeing here is reminiscent of the color that I got the last time. I do expect it will lighten because the color we're seeing is also the color of the dye bath and not all of that is going to bind to the yarn. But the instructions do say to reserve um, and save that liquid and you can do the process over again. And so I think that that's exactly what I will do with a superwash yarn later today. But before I get ahead of myself, I do want to see what the results are like here because if, if the result is a very like pale tan, then I'm probably not gonna go through the whole process again. So I will check back in as soon as things are cool and we'll remove the yarn. But I am coming back to the hot burner for just a second just to show how much pigment we do have in here. And I do see a little bit of sediment. Um, so there's definitely still a lot of color in the dye bath. Okay, we are now at room temperature. It's probably been around three hours later. And I would say there's a hint of warmth back in. And just from a quick squeeze, you can see that the, the color in the yarn is a lot lighter than what we saw in the pot. But let's go rinse it. Shoot, I thought I was filming. So the first rinse of the yarn brought out a lot of like dark brown color, like what we still see in our dye bath. Um, I added some soap and we're still seeing a lot of brown come off, but there's unquestionably color here in the yarn. And I was just going to go and get um, a bucket so I could use a greater volume of water. One of the rationales for bringing in more water is that I will need to squeeze the yarn less as we have it here um, and it'll be easier to rinse out color. Of course, since this is a blue bucket, um, we aren't going to be then seeing the color nearly as well, but I will do what I can to remedy that by taking like our pot um, of this water with say a spoon or we'll look at the color of the runoff. Um, but this by being able to have a greater volume of water for the rinse, and I'll continue to add more, um, it just means that hopefully I will have to manipulate the fiber a little less. But I want to be as gentle as possible. And yeah, you can see that there's still a lot of brown in there. So I'm going to fill up this bucket completely add our yarn. The color is a beautiful brown. There is a little bit of warmth to it, but overall I would call it more of a cool color. And dumping out that water, there's not a lot of pigment in here anymore. So having a larger volume for the rinse can be helpful. 
I'm planning on rinsing it just one last time. Um, here, as I take a look at the water, I'm not seeing any more color in it. You could rinse with soap again. There is a potential for more bleeding at a later date, and I will say I do see some sediment um, in my sink from some of this color that we're rinsing out. So I have a feeling that those are a lot of the holes uh, that I don't think that that little tea bag did a good job of containing, but yeah, I think I'll put this yarn, which on camera, the color isn't coming out very true uh, with the blue pan. All right, that is more true for the color. The color is a fairly cool toned brown. It is definitely not as deep as what we saw in the pot, but I am really, really happy. And Tina, I hope you're excited too. So again, I'm gonna go put this through the spin dryer, hang it to dry, and yeah, let's go back to the dye pot. I'm debating a lot what I wanna do with the leftover dye bath. I know I want to dye some Knit Picks Swish DK, which is 100% superwash merino, versus the merino style we used before that was non-superwash. The question is, do I do 100 grams, 200 grams, just straight kettle dye, or do I want to try to twist it? And after hemming and hawing and hemming and hawing, I think I want to do... Oh, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> All right, I think I'm gonna do 200 grams because even if it's pastel, um, yeah, I'm just curious how much more pastel it'll be. And if this is the same color or just a little bit lighter um, than the non-superwash wool, then that says something as well. Um, I do have the pot fairly crowded at the moment, but we are going to add more water. And just, the nice thing about adding more water like this is you can see that we have not yet dyed the fiber. Pouring the water on is moving that pigment off of the yarn. So it is going to take heat, it is going to take time, but we really just have the walnut holes in here. There's nothing else um, that is contributing to what we are doing. So I am just trying to move the fiber through. And I don't think I'm going to do multiple check-ins because honestly, as I turn this on to slowly heat up to... Um, I'm going to have to move this up so I could see it as I'm going to slowly heat it up to be about 90 degrees. There we go. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm going to do many, many check-ins because I expect visually things aren't going to be very different. But my plan is to slowly uh, bring this up to about 90, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, leave it there for 30 minutes, then bring it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and leave it there for 45 minutes. Then I'll turn off the pot, let things cool completely, at which point we'll come and wash the fiber. Uh, I guess I will pop back in if there's anything notable about my process here, but that's the plan. And we really should get something here that is paler than the first yarn we dyed. And this is the yarn just out of the spin dryer versus the yarn in the pot. Now, one thing to note is that when I have superwash yarn and non-superwash yarn in the pot at the same time, superwash does absorb more color. But what I don't know is if independently the non-superwash yarn maybe would absorb just as much color, but if the superwash yarn is there, it absorbs more and so therefore sucks color away. So I'm very, very curious to see how this yarn will turn out. And so I will see you in a couple of hours in my time, but we'll be ready to wash this yarn for you in just a snap. The next morning when the yarn was completely cool, I removed it from the dye bath. And you can see that there's a lot of pigment left in there. But when we went to go and start rinsing the yarn in cool water and eventually with some soap, 
while again there was a lot of pigment that rinsed out right away um, it did rinse clear fairly quickly using the large volume of water really did help and there's a lot of pigment left in this yarn so I'm gonna put it through the spin dryer hang it up to dry and then we'll come back to compare it to the non superwash yarn that we dyed first without showing you the yarn that is almost dry now uh, you can still see that there's a lot of water in the dye pot and I am going to dispose of this right now in theory we probably could dye more because spoiler alert uh, the amount of pigmentation that was in that superwash yarn is pretty darn close to the amount of pigmentation that we had in our first non superwash yarn but instead of pushing this further and seeing exactly how much we can get out of it today I am going to call it. I am really excited and I recommend trying walnut in the future. But now let's go look at the dry yarn. Okay, as we're starting to rinse, um, our little tea bag is deflated and empty. There's definitely some sediment in here without any question. There is some sediment left in this tea bag. But um, also, I mean, you can see the sediment in the pot. I don't think that this was fine enough to keep all of it inside the bag. Here is the finished yarn that we dyed with walnut. Over here in this warmer reddish tan color, uh, we have the yarn with no mordant that was the merino style DK. This is non-superwash, 100% merino. Over here, we have 200 grams of Knit Picks Swish DK, which is 100% superwash merino, and we dyed these after we did the non-superwash. And so the, the big thing that sort of screams at you right now is the hue difference. The saturation is actually really, really similar. Like, I feel like they all absorbed similar amounts of pigment. As you can see here when I just quickly put on a black and white filter. But I don't have a good answer as to why the hue is different, except there could have been something in the extract, that in the pigments that we extracted from the walnut, that bound um, in the first dye that we did. And so I would, I would hypothesize that if we were to start off dyeing the superwash yarn, we might see more of that red come into there. So I would hypothesize that if we started with the superwash yarn, we might see more of that red pigment in there. Now, using a mordant, like the alum mordant and cream of tartar, is supposed to deepen the warmth. And so we might get more of a chestnutty color, maybe something more intense than that. But overall, I would say that this worked really, really well, and I'm really happy with the results. As for the yarn itself, I absolutely see some tonal variation in our superwash yarn. And it's harder to say how semi-solid, I mean, it's definitely a semi-solid. It's hard to say if some differences I see are just light and shadow on the merino style, or if um, it is some tonal variation. But actually, here's a little piece. Um, on this tie on the yarn, which is likely, uh, I don't know if it's stroll, but it's likely a superwash wool, you can see that the color is richer, but within the same warmth family versus being a slightly more yellow that we see in the superwash here. So I would also add that if we were to start with the superwash yarn, uh, we also would probably see more pigmentation in the yarn um, versus what we saw in the non-superwash because clearly we did remove some of the colored pigments from our dye pot. One other note as I'm filming, this isn't something that I, I would be able to show, but there is still, even though I've rinsed to clear, a little bit of grit left in this yarn. Uh, and so that is some of the walnut hulls that are still in there. So it's just got a little bit of a sandy texture. Now, since I did rinse it and it was clear, I don't think that this causes a staining concern in any capacity, but um, I will certainly note this in the listings. 
Tina, thank you so much for being my lab partner today and suggesting that I do some non-superwash wool in a natural dyeing technique. It was a lot of fun to play with this and I want to do more walnut dyeing. I think that it is really, really exciting and I really enjoy the results and look forward to pumping up the volume. I was nervous that uh, similar to my turmeric, which had very, very little pigment overall, I was afraid that this would end up not having very much color, but we got a lot of pigmentation here and it's beautiful. And so I look forward to uh, playing more with this in the future. So Tina, thank you again. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel. I like to try things that I have experience with in my videos and also things that I am less experienced with because I think that by sharing the process, we can learn together and see what my successes and failures are. And maybe that can just help you as you start on your own dying journey. So subscribe, give the videos a thumbs up and turn on notifications by pressing that bell icon so you don't miss videos in the future. New videos always come out on Tuesday and Friday mornings and I have other stuff that comes out along the way as well and you don't wanna miss it. Thank you so much for watching everyone.